this message by Dave will be taking an offering. I'd like to introduce you now, Dave Hunt. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, our theme for the conference, as I was told, was hope in perilous times. Last night I began by giving you a biblical definition of perilous times. So my topic uh, for this hour is contending for the faith in perilous times. Now I want to try to, you know, you're getting so much information here. Uh, next time maybe a little less talks, <laughs> a little time in between. I don't know how these people are digesting it all. Um, but um, I'm, I'm not complaining. It's very good. Excellent. Excellent stuff you've been getting. I want to try to just um, pull a, a few threads together. Um, we don't need just information. That's one of the problems. You can get overwhelmed. Get information overload. And how do you sort it all out? Uh, Proverbs 4.7 uh, says, Wisdom is the principal thing. That's the difference between being smart and being wise. <laughs> wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. The Bible puts a great emphasis upon understanding. Now, I haven't mentioned, or maybe I will this evening, I, I, who knows when. But I um, appreciate your prayers. I'm writing at the present time. Well, I've talked about this for several years. Uh, it got to be a rather big book, so it will become two books. But uh, we were going to make it volume one and volume two. We decided no. Um, the first one is called Cosmos Creator and Human Destiny. The subtitle is a response to the new aggressive atheism. And um, these atheists, they don't know anything. Uh, they don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know anything about Christianity. And they don't know anything about faith. And in order to, I just had some debates. Where were they? Near Toronto. We will be offering them, I, I hope. Uh, the Lord allowed me to do a good enough job, so <laughs> they will be worth offering. Friday night, I debated a Hindu. Uh, Saturday noon, uh, who, by the way, was a vascular surgeon, local vascular surgeon. 30 years the head of a Hindu temple. And uh, Saturday noon, I debated an atheist philosophy professor from a local university. That evening, I debated a Muslim imam. That's a little too much for an old man, you know. I told him, next time, give me a day between, you know, one every evening. But uh, I just finished at 3 o'clock Saturday debating the atheist in a couple hours later, I got this Muslim coming after me who uh, is an imam. By the way, he's a professional. Uh, I guess this is being recorded, so I shouldn't say he's a snake. Uh, but uh, but he's very slippery, very clever, a professional. He debates Christians all over the world. And he can quote the Bible faster than you can. Uh, now, that was a little bit much. But anyway, to prepare for debates is very helpful to listen to debates. I've listened to many debates. <laughs> and I've got them, they give me the DVDs, no, the CDs stacked up in my kitchen. The only time I, I don't, I can't listen to something when I'm working on the computer. Only time I have to listen to something is when I'm making my breakfast, which I always do, whether my wife is home or not, uh, and making my lunch, which I always do, whether she's home or not. She fixes the dinner when she's there. But anyway, I've listened to a lot of, a lot of these guys. Well, I think uh, 
maybe David or Yaakov who know the Hebrew would uh, be interested. Uh, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, where are they? I haven't seen it. Okay, here comes Yaakov. Christopher Hitchens, brilliant, Jewish, and he can say things so fast and so sarcastic. For example, he'll say, well, you're telling me that my ancestors wandered through the desert thinking that, that lying and stealing and murder and adultery was all okay, until they got to the base of Mount Sinai, they found out it wasn't kosher after all. Yeah? No, that's not the way it goes. And they will argue that an atheist, well, he can uh, do good things. He can uh, has morals and so forth. Yes, because God has written that in every heart. So, um, but anyway, they all say... Every atheist I've heard debate says, yeah, but faith, faith, that's just believing in something without evidence. And you don't need to understand it. Well, the Bible says, with all thy getting, get understanding. And if you went to Isaiah 9, 24, uh, well, 23, says, let not the wise boast in his wisdom or the rich in his riches or the mighty in his might, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. For I am the Lord who execute loving kindness, judgment, and justice in the earth. And then if you went to Matthew 13, we have the parable of the sower who went forth to sow. The first seed fell by the wayside. The birds of the air came and took it. And you know what Jesus said. Uh, the disciples said, well, tell us, well, what does this mean? Jesus said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh that wicked one and takes from the heart that was sown. We have to have understanding. And I try to get Christians to think because it's not easy to do. Um, but we need to think. Now, I just want to just kind of, we've had a lot of things going on here. I'm talking about biblical messages like Yaakov's and David's that we just heard. Uh, I'm talking, and, and also John's. I'm, I'm talking about some of the New Age stuff and so forth, which is in the church. Where does it come from? And what, what are the commonalities of this? How can we understand it? Oh, one of the first things we need to understand, the difference between naturalism and supernaturalism. Okay, by the way, I won't launch off into something, but um, Arthur, not a Christian, physicist. Some of these men, I learn a lot from them. For example, you can very quickly prove there is a difference between the spirit and the flesh. Eddington says, there is a difference between uh, physical laws, natural, I'm sorry, physical laws and, and natural laws, which must be obeyed. You're not going to defy the law of gravity. They must be obeyed. You can't escape them. And moral laws which ought to be obeyed. And then he says, ought takes us outside of physics and chemistry. Okay, you can say that to anybody. Wait, wait a minute, you're not just lumping protein molecules. There's a spirit involved in this. But anyway, we've got to distinguish between naturalism and supernaturalism. Satan has many powers. He does not have supernatural powers. Understand that. Only God has supernatural powers. And one of the things, um, you know, Satan put boils on Job. He could take them off. Uh, but one of the things that Jesus, how he proved that he was the Messiah, that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, I say to the sick of the palsy, take up your bed and walk. And Jesus was saying, look, forget these phony healers. 
There is no true healing except by the one who can forgive sins because sickness came by sin. Well, so we've got to understand there's a difference between natural and supernatural. Now, these New Agers do not have supernatural power. Some of them have paranormal power. They can do things by the power of Satan. Now, Satan, Satan is subject to the laws too, but he's in a different dimension. And I'm not going to try to explain, explain much here. But when he invades this dimension in which we live, some strange things can happen. Uh, he took Jesus up to a mountain uh, and, and so forth. So get the distinction. Don't ever say that a psychic or some of these people, uh, they're doing something supernatural. It is not supernatural. It may be beyond your comprehension to understand. Probably it's, it's phony. Uh, it's a fake. But Satan does not have supernatural power. Now there are people who have strange powers. Witch doctors, shamans, some of them are phonies, some of them have real power. Wow. Uh, now, if you got a book by, uh, um, oh my goodness, his name is escaping me and I didn't, did I write it down? Yeah. Michael Harner. Michael Harner wrote a book called The Way of the Shaman. Now, some people say shaman. I think it's shaman, but I don't, I, I'm not no authority. The Way of the Shaman. Now, wh where did this word come from? Well, he says it comes from the Tungus tribe in Siberia, and this is what they call their witch doctors, medicine men, shamans. And anthropologists have adopted it worldwide. You know, it rolls off the tongue very nicely. Sounds a little nicer than witch doctor or so forth. Uh, so they've adopted that everywhere for these people who have these kind of powers. Now, you might find it interesting. Everything Gary's been talking about or, or, or whoever's talking about New Age or whatever. Michael Harner, who is a practicing shaman, witch doctor. Now, first of all, he says, one thing you need to know, you can travel all over this world. And you can investigate shamanism, witchcraft, whatever it is. It is the same everywhere. It has certain elements in common. Well, that tells you that the, you, you, that there's a common origin. There's a common inspiration behind behind this. Now, what is what is involved? Michael Harner, who is a shaman, who is an authority, is an anthropologist, he says there are basically five things involved. Uh, I, I may not get them in the right order, but I think he begins with visualization first. The most powerful occult technique, the quickest way to get into the occult, whether it's through, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Silva, Jose Silva. I debated him on John Ankerberg's show, I think it was, on TV. Never saw such a pitiful creature. He was under the power of Satan. It was pitiful to, to face him, but he supposedly had these supernatural powers. Visualization, it's in the church. I, I, I don't have time to go into that. It's in um, inner healing. Visualize Jesus. Or well, a lot of them talk about, oh, you want to get to really know Jesus? Visualize Jesus coming to you. Jesus will not come to you when you visualize him. You think you can call from the right hand of the Father on high, the Son of God, to come and talk to you and manifest himself? No, but I can tell you there are a lot of demons that know how to act like Jesus, like what you want to think Jesus is. Okay, I'm sorry, I won't go into any more details. We won't have time to get where we're going. Visualization, number one. Number two, hypnosis. Gary warned you about that. It's practiced by hundreds of Christian psychologists. It's, one, it's at the heart of Christian psychology. Hypnosis, it puts you in an altered state of consciousness. 
And you learn some things from hypnosis. You can, the hypnotist can control the person that he hypnotizes. I think Gary went into a little detail about that. Well, wait a minute. But he's doing it not by some physical manipulation. He doesn't have any wires connected to you. He's doing it from his mind to your mind. Now, Sir John Eccles described the brain as a machine that a ghost can operate. And he said in the normal state of consciousness, you are the ghost that operates that brain. In an altered state, you can reach, you get a book in the library, 250 ways to reach an altered state of consciousness without drugs. And apropos to what Gary was saying, I'll never forget a dear lady who came to me after a meeting. She said, and by the way, you, well, David mentioned a couple of his books. I've got a book about yoga. You really need to know. You really need to read that. In fact, John MacArthur, dear friend, but well, we've got our differences, wrote me a hand note saying, Dave, I really appreciate that book. Taught, taught me a lot. But in an altered state, your, the connection between you and your brain is loosened, allowing another ghost Another spirit to interpose itself began to tick off the neurons in your brain and create a universe of illusion. That's where the psychedelic colors and the psychedelic experiences come from and so forth. And then, interestingly, this is Michael Horner. He's not a Christian. He's telling you, let me tell you what witchcraft is. Let me tell you what shamanism is. It's the same everywhere. I can go to a little island in the South Pacific and talk to their shamans and I can tell them what they're into before they tell me because it's the same thing everywhere. What's the next thing? Psychotherapy. Those are the words that he uses. This is shamanism. This is witchcraft. This is what the witch doctors use. And then the next two things you might guess them. Positive thinking and positive speaking. Now take it from a shaman telling you exactly what witchcraft is and it's been that way for thousands of years. He says you can visit uh, tribes or whatever. They've been isolated for thousands of years. They've had no contact with one another. And when you investigate their shamanism, it is the same everywhere. Okay? I think that's probably worth knowing. Now, how did... Uh, these lies of the serpent come uh, come into uh, the church. Well, did I bring it? Yes. Some of you may have gotten this. This is a clever little thing. Uh, it's uh, one book on one side, another on the other, because these were just sample chapters. And uh, if you don't mind me just reading a little bit, uh, Whoops, <laughs> my glasses got in the way, sort. Um, this is two books, and uh, by the way, uh, many of you have asked, can't we have occult invasion back? Uh, yes, I I've revised it, updated it, and so forth, and it should be in print again soon. Now, this one is Psychology in the Church. How many of you have seen the DVD, Psychology in the Church? Okay, a few of you. I think it's worth seeing. Uh, and we have a, a book that will go with it, and the DVD will be in the, in the book for no extra charge. And let me give you a little sample out of here. This is from my introduction. Now, Tom wrote some of the chapters, but I wrote most of the chapters. And it says, what is Christian psychology? I think that's the introduction. We are often asked if we are Christian psychologists and find it difficult to answer. This is a couple of Christian psychologists speaking to a seminar of Christian psychologists, several hundred of them there. We're often asked if, um, we are often asked if we are Christian psychologists and find it difficult to answer since we don't know what the question implies. We are Christians who are psychologists but at the present time, there is no acceptable Christian psychology that is markedly different from non-Christian psychology. Okay? <laughs> it's the same thing. 
This is where it came from. They didn't get it out of the Bible. And I think I quoted it last night, did I? Bruce Naramore, because I couldn't remember his name. And remember what he says? It was humanistic psychologists Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers who first made us aware of the need of self-love and self-esteem. We thought, well, that's a great idea. Well, maybe we can go back to the Bible and massage some verses around and make it look like that's what Holy Writ always meant. And nobody knew it until the godless, atheistic psychologists explained the Bible to us. Okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't get so sarcastic. Um, well, it's in the church. And how did it get there? I thought you would find this uh, rather enlightening. This is a subheading. Well, enter the Trojan horse. And I say, this came, can you believe it? The man most responsible for the Trojan horse operation was none other than arch heretic Norman Vincent Peale. He's the one who brought it into the church. And uh, I'll give you just a little bit of what he taught. Prayer power, and you re relate this to the difference between naturalism and supernaturalism. Prayer power is a manifestation of energy. What is energy? It's a naturalistic power. That's part of nature. Manifestation of energy, just, just as there exists scientific techniques for the release of atomic energy, so are there scientific procedures for the release of spiritual energy through the mechanism of prayer. You see what he's doing? This is taking the supernatural and turning it into something natural. Oh, to techniques? Oh, you can use techniques. You can release this mechanism through the mechanism of prayer. See, prayer is simply a way to release. Well, he goes on and says it's like, uh, atomic energy and so forth. Prayer is a procedure by which spiritual power flows from God, releases forces and energies. One must learn step by step the formula for opening the circuit and so forth. He says there's a powerful and mysterious force, a kind of mental engineering that works best when supported by a strong religious faith. Oops. <laughs> I got some very serious problems. I, I, I don't need to explain any more to you. I think you understand. Supernaturalism is different. And you cannot get God's power to flow by some technique. That's what witchcraft is. When the witch doctor slits the rooster's throat and sprinkles the blood in a certain pattern and mumbles a formula, bingo! The spirits will come through and operate. You don't get God to do that, but that is the teaching of the whole charismatic movement. Now let me just quote, well, before we get to that. So this is right off of, you can look it up, <laughs> I have to be a genius to do a little research. Uh, you can look this up on Norman Vincent Peale's homepage, and I'll just quote a little from it. In nine, this is from his homepage. In 1937, Peel established a clinic with Freudian psychiatrist Dr. Smiley Blanton in the basement of the Marble Collegiate Church. You understand, I'm not saying this. Peel's homepage is saying this. Blanton brought with him extensive experience of having undergone psychoanalysis by Freud himself. Wow. Freud was a fraud. He's a, well, I can't, I, I've got to stop trying to go into detail. I mean, this is incredible stuff. but. He was psychoanalyzed by Freud himself in Vienna in 1929, 1935, 1936, and 1937. You only need to get saved once, <laughs> but you've got to get psychoanalyzed over and over and over. The clinic was described as having, quote, a theoretical base that was union with a strong evidence of neo and post-Freudianism. This is a clinic Norman Vincent Peale opened in his basement of the Marble Collegiate Church, okay? It subsequently grew to an operation with more than 20 psychiatric doctors and psychologically trained ministers, and in 1951 became known as the American Foundation for Religion and Psychiatry, and so forth and so on. It says, indeed, Peel pioneered the merger of theology and psychology 
which became known as Christian psychology. You want to know a little bit about Norman? I think I don't need to tell you about Norman Vincent Peale. An arch heretic. Incredible what he taught. It was all against the truth of the Word of God. Peale applied Christianity to everyday problems and so forth. Uh, he wrote, your unconscious mind has power that turns wishes into realities and so forth. Now, if you go to uh, the Baker Encyclopedia of Psychology and Counseling, according to J. Harold Ellens, he's the author of a section on Peale in that book, quote, I'm quoting him, Peale's work was initially scorned by ministers and therapists alike. Dr. Peel was three quarters of a century ahead of the times with his emphasis um, my glasses are doing tricks on me three quarters ahead of the, a century ahead of, the, uh, of his time with emphasis upon the relationship between psychology and Christian experience he saw psychology and Christian experience as very compatible. Uh, he had the courage to stand pat, listen to this, I wanted you to know this, for nearly half a century. He was opposed by the entire evangelical church for half a century. They said, we don't want this stuff. This is not of God. This is not biblical. But Peel just stood his ground. And what do you know, pretty soon, as I mentioned last night, one of the most popular t uh, subjects in Christian colleges and the most popular speakers at Christian conferences, the whole evangelical church said no for more than 50 years. But Peel prevailed. They decided they could get PhDs and so forth. Then, okay, pardon me for reading. The Another heading, the virus spreads. In 1968, Clyde Naramore and his nephew Bruce Naramore founded the Rosemead School of Psychology, quote, to train clinical psychologists from a Christian perspective. The whole evangelical church said, no. <laughs> now we got a Christian perspective. With its primary focus on the integration of of psychology and theology. In 1977, Rosemead merged with Biola University. Wow, you know the roots of that, with R.A. Torrey and, and so forth. Merged with Biola University and in La Mirada, California, where it gained accreditation from the American Psychological Association in 1980. I'll never forget. Um, big article headlines at, at the uh, Fuller Graduate School of, of, Theol of, of Psychology. Accredited! Wow! We got accredited! And it went on to say how an APA, American Psychological Association, uh, on-site visitation team had just come and checked us out and they gave us the imprimatur. They said, and I think I can quote them from memory, uh, we found their courses in psychology to meet our standards in spite of their religious orientation. How about that? Now you got Satan's imprimatur. Isn't that something to boast of? Rosemead got it. Well, I better stop uh, with that kind of stuff. I wanted you to know where Christian psychology came from. It did not come from the Bible. It came from arch heretics. And the entire evangelical church said no for more than 50 years. And finally, they caved in. And now they are the heroes. Uh, we got we got really serious problems. Now, let me just give you an illustration. This is out of um, occult invasion. One of the foremost promoters of 
shamanism, Pat Robertson. Uh, he wrote a book, I f forget when, The Secret Kingdom. He had the secret. You thought you knew about it. You thought you could get it about it from the Bible. No, no, Pat had the secret. He was inspired to write a book. Oh, what was it? $100 to begin with, I think. He had to make a contribution, and it finally dropped to 1295. But uh, why he was the one who had the secret of the secret kingdom? What was the secret kingdom about? Naturalism, not supernaturalism. He said there are eight laws in the kingdom. Whoa, look out. Anybody's got some laws, spiritual laws, and they're not the biblical laws, you, you're getting taken in. Uh, well, one of them, amazingly, it's, all, it's all, almost a joke, I'm sorry. The law of miracles. He said, God never does a miracle except according to the law of miracles. What? A miracle overrides the laws. That's the reason why it's, it's a miracle. Oh, yeah, but God himself, he's subject to laws, too. You understand? And so he can only do miracles if he follows the law of miracles. I mean, what rubbish. Uh, and yet people, oh, wow, wow. We can, we can learn what the laws are. Now we can make miracles flow. Listen to what he says. This is Pat Robertson. You can perform miracles if you but understand the power of God and the laws that unlock God's power. See, you know, there are certain powers out there, and they're actually occult powers. And if you know the techniques for tapping into them, then what, what's, why was the appeal so great when they walked out of that first Star Wars film, May the Force be with you? Why? Because a force, I can control it. <laughs> God's not a force, and he doesn't use laws. He is uh, supernatural. I mean, he is beyond nature. He's beyond. He is the author. Okay, so he says, we speak to money, and it comes. We speak to storms, and they cease. When you confess blessing and success, these things will come to you. Well... Worked for him, although he had a little fraud involved, uh, where somehow millions of dollars that were given to him to uh, get the Christian message, the gospel, into the secular world uh, through, um, uh, what was it called, the, first, the channel? No, family channel, thank you. And they gave him millions of dollars because he was going to get the gospel into the secular world on TV by the family channel. What happened? Well, Pat's a lawyer. He's a little smarter than Jim Baker. And uh, he managed by legal maneuvering. Somehow he came up owning this thing. And then what does he do? He begins to drive the Christians off. The very thing he said this was for, he begins to drive them off. Uh, and uh, then finally he sold it to Rupert Murdoch, wasn't it? Uh, for how many billion? 1.9 billion, I think it was. Wow. I mean, talk about fraud. Christians invested it to get the gospel on TV. And he managed to take control and sell it to the godless people, and he comes out of it a billionaire. Well, we got some horrible stuff going on in the Christian world, and people love to, love to have it so, apparently. Okay, now I'm going to read you. This is uh, a certain man. Uh, if you know it, don't shout out his name yet. Let the other people guess. Um, he was, he had some amazing credentials. A former Christian leader, uh, 
one of, he was one of the co-founders of Youth for Christ. Who pre he preached for them internationally. In 1946, he was listed by the National Association of Evangelicals as among those, quote, best used by God, unquote. He was a founder and pastor for seven years of a successful and growing church in Toronto. For three years, he was the director of evangelism for the Presbyterian Church USA. He represented the National Council of Churches for, for years um, on preaching missions, mostly across the United States and Canada, but some internationally, uh, seeing an average of about 150 converts of each night, uh, like, in, like in Evansville, Indiana, uh, where 91,000 people uh, attended the, his crusade, uh, only 128,000 people in that, in that city. A survey showed that he had a higher percentage of converts who actually stuck, uh, far higher than his friend Billy Graham, with whom he used to speak. He was Billy Graham's co-evangelist. They preached for years together. Anybody know his name? Well, okay, of course, Yaakov knows. James Kennedy? No. Yes, Chuck, Chuck Templeton. <laughs> well, of course, of course. Let me, let me give you the rest of the story. The whole time, he was an unbeliever. Why? In his autobiography, this is important, he confessed, I never could believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now, this is important. Genesis is the foundation of the Bible. It is being undermined. Now, if you want to hear what... <coughs> you want to hear what the Renovari Spiritual Formation Bible... Uh, has to say, the Renovari Spiritual Formation Bible is about that thick. It um, has commentaries by 50 biblical scholars, some of them names you would recognize. And it very clearly says, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are pagan myths. And they've been re-edited to give it a monotheistic uh, slant. We don't even have the Bible anymore. But let me, go, let me continue reading here. Well, the abandonment of a literal interpretation of the Bible, especially the first 11 chapters of, of, of Genesis, has turned many professing Christians into atheists. Charles Templeton finally made a firm decision to abandon all pretense because he could not believe in the God described as the creator of the universe. This rejection of the biblical account of creation is a recurring theme throughout his autobiography titled Farewell to God. Charles Templeton, once one of the original enthusiastic organizers of Youth for Christ, offers an invaluable lesson for us today. Genesis is the foundation. Well, finally, he contacted his good friend Billy Graham. Uh, I, people don't like me to say anything about Billy Graham, or some people do. I, I just speak the truth. We just give you the facts. Here's what he said. He's got this recorded in his autobiography. But Billy, it's simply not possible any longer to believe, for instance, the biblical account of creation. The world wasn't created over a period of days, a few thousand years ago. It has evolved over millions of years. It's not a matter of speculation. It's demonstrable fact. That's a lie. Uh, in fact, evolution and natural selection have been proven wrong. To find a biblical faith, Templeton went to, back to seminary. He wanted to be more used for God. He went back to a seminary and... What did he, where did he go? Princeton Theological Seminary, totally apostate uh, when he arrived there. Uh, and some of the professors were Darwinists and so forth. I'm sorry, I thought this was just going to be a brief introduction. 
<laughs> it turned out to, oh my goodness, it was 15 minutes, about two minutes ago, and now it's, suddenly it's 10. Uh, okay, you, you may be right. Well, when you get as old as I am, it uh, time flies. Well, my topic this evening then is supposed to be contending for the faith in perilous times. You think we need to contend for the faith? Once for all delivered to the saints? I mean, with this kind of stuff uh, going on, we've got faith teachers, of course. We've got, uh, oh my goodness, we, we, we've... We've got false teaching about faith. What is faith? The faith. He doesn't say contend for believing that something will happen. You know, this is what many people think faith is. Well, if I can just believe that what I'm praying for will happen, then, then that's faith. No, that's mind power. If you, you don't need God. If you can make things happen by believing they'll happen, you don't need God. Faith is believing that God will make it happen. Jesus said in Mark 11, have faith in God. You want to speak to this mountain? Be thou removed? Okay. You have a, you don't need great faith. You just need a grain of mustard seed's worth. But it must be in the right God. And it must be according to His will. So, if it's not God's will, if it's not God's way, if it's not God's time, He's not going to do it. And you're not going to make Him do it by some mind power. You're not going to talk God into doing what He does not want to do. Okay? So, one of the lessons we learn is faith demands obedience. And we need to uh, obey the Lord. We need to be submitted to His will. Uh, and, uh, well... I've got a whole lot here about Al Gore. You would find it very interesting. He was raised in an evangelical fundamentalist church. Can you believe that? I guess it never got a hold of him. Um, and he's gone off into all kinds of uh, New Age stuff, everything. Uh, he's uh, at, at, a, at a prayer breakfast when he was vice president. He said, faith in some higher power, in my opinion, is essential by, by whatever name. So now we're talking naturalism. This is not supernaturalism. This is not getting to know the true God. This is tapping into some kind of a power out there, some higher power. Higher than what? What do you mean by a power? No, that's not the way that it works. And then, of course, we've got people like Mother Teresa. Now, I used to really get criticized when I told the truth about Mother Teresa. How can you pick on her? Well, I'm not picking on her. Now she's picking on herself. So you can read the, um, her letters to her father confessor in which she doesn't even believe in God. She has no peace. She doesn't know where she's going when she dies. She was a tormented woman. Why? Because where was her hope? Her hope was in the Catholic Church. Uh, but uh, Billy Graham, I'm sorry. He praised her, as have other evangelical leaders. Oh, what a wonderful woman. You want to read the truth about Mother Teresa? Get Mother Teresa the final, de um, the final, what is it? The final, not decree, the final, uh, what, when you have a court decision, Bill? Final verdict, thank you. <laughs> Mother Teresa, the final verdict, written by a medical doctor who grew up in Calcutta, and he will tell you the truth about Mother Teresa. She had millions in the bank, but the patients, sleeping on little pallets on the floor, giving them some aspirin or whatever as they're dying in excruciating pain, because she believed that suffering will get you to heaven. So let's help them, help them to suffer a, 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 a bit. Well, I'm, uh, uh, what, are, what are these guys up to? I don't know whether you ever read, I have to do a little bit of reading. Uh, did you ever read the uh, testimony of Patty Roberts, the divorced wife of 
Richard Roberts. Uh, she said that when they were going to leave for their honeymoon, Oral took her and Richard into his study. He warned them if they ever left Oral's ministry, they would be killed in a plane crash. She tells of growing disillusionment and so forth, and uh, led to clashes with, with, with Oral. It seemed to her that all the efforts were revolved around fundraising, sophisticated techniques to sell Jesus for money, so finally she had a conversation uh, with, uh, the, uh, Al, with Al Bush, longtime president of Oral Roberts Evangelical Association. Here was her conversation. I got just almost enough time to finish a <laughs> two-minute sign. Al, she's talking to him on the phone. Al, in the 40 shows that we taped last year, how many times did we give people the plan of salvation? Al says, the plan of salvation? Gosh, Patty, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm sure we must have given it to them at least once. And how many times did we give them the principles of seed faith? He laughed. Well, Patty, you know the answer to that. We give the principles of seed faith on every show. What's this all about? Al, in the letters that you received from viewers, how many of them thought that maybe if they gave money to Oral, they had bought a little place in the kingdom how many may have thought that swayed God's opinion about their eternal destiny? He didn't answer for a long time. When he finally replied, he lowered his voice and said soberly and a bit hesitantly, a whole lot of them did, Patty. Whoa. Now we're back to naturalism again. You give some money, and you're going to get supernatural benefits. Uh, well, I haven't had time. <laughs> to get anywhere, get where I was going. No, you probably never heard of Kirby John Caldwell. Oh, he wrote a wonderful book, The Gospel of Good Success. How about that? And our President Bush praised him, had his picture taken with him. He was one of those points of light that Bush was talking about. This thing gets pretty mixed up and you find out that there are almost nobody is on the truth. Who is following the Bible? Who is on the Lord's side? Very, very few. That's why this isn't filled. If I was going to lay hand, you know, touch people and they fall over, uh, you know, that's a Hindu practice. It's called Shakti Pat. Shakti is the goddess of force. And they can do it a whole lot better than these guys on TV. Give them a Shakti Pat. Touch them. Pew! They're off on a spiritual trip. Now, this is nothing new. This is a, the world of shamanism. This is not supernatural. This is naturalism. And that's Satan's domain. And, uh, well, sorry, I tried to waken you up a little bit. But uh, we need to think. We need to know our facts. Wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But with all you're getting, Get understanding. When Peter, 1 Peter 3.15, he says, Be ready always to give an answer to everyone <clears throat> who wants to know the most emotional experience that you've ever had about Jesus. No. Who wants to know a reason. A reason. And God says, come now and let us reason together. Faith is not some leap in the dark, I'm just going to believe it. No, I was raised a Catholic, I'm born a Catholic, I'll die a Catholic. No. Born an evangelical, I'll die an evangelical. No. You better know God. You better know the true God that David was, was talking about and the true Messiah. And that is based on facts. This is truth. This is not feelings. Thank you.